Buenos días a todos. Eh, bienvenidos a. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar on obstacle limitation services. My name is Fabio Salvatierra. I'm uh, the Airdrome and Ground Aid uh, Officer for the ICAO South American Office. First of all, thank you very much for participating in this session. We are going to start with a few words by our Deputy Director of uh, the South American Office of ICAO, Mr. Oscar Quesada. Oscar, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. For those of you who are in another continent, seeing the agenda for the meeting, is uh, it, it is like preparing the region for what's coming in the future. And that's why I want to congratulate all the organizers and all the region for being here to uh, become aware of uh, the challenges on obstacle limitation surfaces, which is not a simple issue. An issue that involves uh, probably coordination at the level of states and with other authorities and areas with which the aeronautical authority does not necessarily interact on a normal basis as a topic that goes beyond the areas of competence of civil aviation. We have the challenge of how to legislate the area and how to make it work. So I think it's uh, very interesting to be uh, uh, preparing um, uh, the legislation. It, it still needs to be approved because we need to make the change to prepare everybody to start thinking of how to make this change to digest the impact that it's going to have to start doing change management starting now. I don't want to take up more of your time. I just want to thank you all for being here and the organizers for having it generates a uh, situational awareness amongst all of you about what's coming. So thank you very much and have a very successful event. Goodbye. Thank you very much, uh, Oscar, for your words. Uh, certainly, it's going to be a major challenge, uh, the implementation of these new measures and what you said to prepare the region for what's coming. Thank you. Now we are going to and make some, uh, to give some instructions about the event. Uh, first of all, I wanted to greet uh, the entities uh, that are participating in this event. In addition to IKO headquarters, we have the participation of uh, representatives of uh, the Spain Safety Agency, the DSEA of Brazil, and the uh, National Civil Aviation Authority of Uruguay. Thank you very much to your administrations, to your states, for allowing you to, to share your experience with us. The event is uh, scheduled until uh, 12.30 Lima time for hours. We are including an option for questions and answers, which is in the Zoom menu under the letters Q and A. If you have any questions, uh, please um, make them there. The panel, the panelists will answer the questions and if they don't have the answers, the answers will be published on the website of the event later. We also have uh, the possibility of uh, receiving the questions uh, through email and the um, email address is there. 
we have simultaneous interpretation available. So if you want to listen in English or Spanish, you can select the respective language in the menu. At the end of the event, you will receive a survey. We would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to answer that survey that will help us uh, to organize uh, better these events. Once again, in the agenda, we have ASA matters starting with OLS transformation by a colleague from IKO headquarters. I'm going to introduce him later. Then two sessions about uh, optical um, limitation surfaces in one session about aeronautical studies, something new that is being addressed within the task force. We also have a presentation by the SRV SOP, the regional system on the AGA provisions, uh, the experience of Uruguay, and finally, uh, a small presentation about the next steps. So the presentations are posted on this uh, site. If you see any difference between the presentations uh, to be made now and those posted, don't worry. We are going to update uh, the link uh, with the latest presentations. And finally, I want to take advantage of this moment to have a small survey on your screen. You should have two questions in English and Spanish. So I would ask you to please answer these questions. I think some of you already started to answer. I'll give you a few minutes to answer this uh, small poll that will help us uh, get this information. Right now we have a 90 participants online. So let's give them a few more seconds. In the meantime, I'm going to ask R.C. to start preparing his presentation. Very well then, R.C., I'm seeing your presentation on the screen. In a few seconds, we will stop the poll. Just a few more participants. Ten more seconds to answer the poll, please. Very well, thank you very much. So these are the results. We have a, a more a great participation of civil aviation authorities, but also consulting companies and airport operators. And 70% of the participants had heard about these changes, but 30% hadn't. So I think it's always good to get this information. So thank you all. RC, go ahead, please. Oh, before you start, I wanted to introduce RC Raman. He's a technical officer of the operations and interoperability of airports as IKO headquarters in Montreal. RC, go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Do you hear me? Fabio, do you hear me? Okay. Uh, hello, all. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to you, wherever you are. Uh, thanks, Fabio, for the introduction. And at the outset, I would like to thank IKO SAM office for having this webinar on OLS transformation. 
on, on, on the changes which are going to happen in this particular topic of obstacle limitation surfaces. Uh, again, I'm R.C. Raman. I am the Secretary for the Obstacle Limitation Task Force of ICAO, which is leading this work on the changes in OLS. First, I'm very happy to hear that around 70% of the participants are aware of this change. So that's a really a good news and a good start for us. This, as we know, is a kind of a complex topic. It, is, it, it involves more than the aviation professionals. It involves the town planners. It involves flight procedure designers. It's, it's, a, it's a bigger thing. So I understand that it's a complex topic. It will be extremely difficult for us to cover this complex topic within the next three, four hours. We understand that there are there will be several questions, but the idea of my presentation here is going to be short. This is basically to give you an idea about what these changes are about. So the contents of my presentation are, sorry, yeah. Do you see the slight change? See, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so in a nutshell, in the next 20 odd minutes, what we are going to see is what is the need for the change? We know that the obstacle limitation surfaces has been there for quite some time in the next 14, and it has been used in other PANS uh, aircraft operations as well. We, we all are aware of it, but what's the need for the change? What we are going to do? And I'm going to talk very shortly about the proposed changes. What is it that you can expect in, in, in Annex 14 Volume 1. Uh, the subsequent speakers will get into the details of this. The idea is to kind of set the scene or familiarize you with the terminology so that it's easy for us to discuss subsequently because the experts who are from the OLS task force are going to talk to you later on. And I'm also going to touch a bit on, on what we intend to do in terms of having a chapter in pan serotones or aeronautical studies and how we are going to implement what are the next steps in when it comes to the ikeo head office for implementing these paradigm shift or a huge change that we are expecting to do again i would like to start with a bit of a disclaimer these proposals are in a mature stage however they have not yet been approved by the governing bodies of ICAO. Say, for example, the ANC or the council have not yet been approved. So the idea of sharing this information is to socialize the concept, make you familiarize with these big changes which are going to come so that you're prepared. And we will subsequently see about what steps ICAO is going to take in terms of supporting states and the industry in implementing these new procedures. So with that, I would like to start this presentation on the need for change. Before we get on to that, I'm sure that most of you are aware of what is the objective of this OLS? Why at all do we need it? Basically, the objective is twofold. It's, it's, it's very simple. This has been there almost from the 1950s in Annex 14, Volume 1. It, it's mainly to ensure safety of aircraft operation and to ensure accessibility of aerodromes. Because if you have obstacles around the aerodromes, it's going to be extremely difficult for the usage, safe usage of those aerodromes by aircraft. So that is the reason why this particular objective have been clearly defined in Annex 14. So we all know also what the OLS basically does. I don't need to get on to the details of that. Most of you are aware of it. It is basically to protect the aircraft carry out visual approaches or the visual phase of an instrument approach. So that's the idea of this safeguarding which needs to be done around the aerodromes. So that is the broad objective. So going a bit back to history, we all know that there are detailed SAPs in Annex 14 Volume 1, especially on Chapter 4, related to obstacle limitation surfaces. In fact, these SAPs were first developed way back in 1950s, and later on, they were modified in the 70s and the 80s. So they are pretty old. So one of the questions which came to ICAO through in one of the assemblies almost nine years ago is, there is a need for us to review this particular obstacle limitation surfaces, the provisions related to obstacle limitation surfaces in the annex. And one of the reasons which was cited is that they do not address the capabilities of modern aircraft operations. We have got new aircraft with new capabilities, new navigation systems, with different approach speeders, with different accuracies. Whether 
the existing surfaces are over conservative, over protective, whether they need to be looked into. So these were the questions brought out in one of the assemblies almost nine years ago. And because of which the ANC asked the aerodrome design and operations panel to work on this, therefore, the obstacle limitation surfaces task force was set up. This had experts from various fields, from different states, industries, flight procedure designers. There were a lot of data which was churned by this group. And this group developed what we are going to see as a mature proposal. Again, whatever you're going to see in this presentation and the subsequent presentation have not been approved, but these are just about information. There might be some minor changes in what you're seeing in these presentations, but the concepts are more or less finalized. So moving forward, because of these changes, the obstacle limitation task force had several meetings. You can understand that from 2015, this obstacle limitation task force has been working for almost seven years. There have been a lot of discussions. We understand the challenges. So what are the challenges basically? If you look at the OLS provisions in, in, in various annexes and pans, the one of the challenge is about how to harmonize these surfaces between different annexes or pans. Because Annex 14, Chapter 4 talks about a particular type of surface, whereas your PANS OPS DOC 8168 talks about having a different type of surface. Even though there are some connectivities, it needs to be assessed and the gaps between these two annexes or these two things needs to be identified and closed. So that was one of the reasons. And you have different types of areas defined in Annex 4. And X15. So one of the biggest challenge for this particular task force is to harmonize, bring them all into some kind of a common platform so that it is easy for someone to apply these surfaces. That is the first thing. The next thing is we need to look at whether the surfaces which are applicable today or the surfaces that we are going to propose today are adaptable for future aircraft operations we may have a slightly different type of aircraft operations. So based on those type of operations, can we give some amount of flexibility to states and the industry to define the surfaces at the same time, ensuring safety of aircraft operations? So, so, so that's the biggest challenge which the obstacle limitation task force was facing. And the next thing is about, we have existing surfaces, are they, overburdening? Are they a bit more than what is required? Or is it sufficient? That's a call that the obstacle limitation surfaces need to take place. Do we change the dimensions of some of the existing surfaces? If we change it, how do we change it? So these were the broader questions that were asked by the obstacle limitation task force. So when we try to develop a set of surfaces, what we looked into is, what is the purpose? Why do we need to have an approach or a transition surface? we felt it needs to be clearly defined. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we need to do it. So the moment we clearly define why you need this surface with a purpose, so in the, in the upcoming provisions, you will see those changes. And it needs to be performance-based depending on the type of operations conducted at an aerodrome. If, if it depending on the type of aircraft operating, depending on whether it's going to be a position approach, non-position approach, so on and so forth. So these were the big challenges faced by the obstacle limitation task force. We did a lot of brainstorming. There were several meetings and based on which we arrived at these proposals. So what are the proposed changes? Now, some of you may be already aware of, we use the term obstacle limitation surfaces. So what the OLS task force proposes is to have this as two sets of services in order to ensure safety, at the same time, provide sufficient flexibility for states and international organizations. How do we do it? We have something called as an obstacle free surface. As the term itself mentioned, it is a free surface, which means it's a kind of a hard surface. And again, we have something called as an obstacle evaluation surface, which means it's a kind of a trigger surface. There is an element of flexibility for states to have to decide whether they need to have an OES or they may not have an OES depending on the type of operations and the level of protection they need to provide for their operations. So how do we do it? 
these two surfaces have got different purposes, distinct purposes, based on the type of runway on the aeroplane design group, which we'll be seeing soon. And there'll be detailed discussion subsequently by Tiago as well, and about the flight procedures available for that runway. So I'm not going to go into too much of detail, but I would like to give a bit of a bird's eye view of what these surfaces are. So if you look at the obstacle-free surface, it is a surface which is going to be closer to the aerodrome environs, which means it's something which is going to protect the airspace closer to the runway. So which means it also needs to protect in case if we have any future operations in this aerodrome, it, this particular surface OFS is a shell. It needs to be there. So how do we decide or how do we design these OFS? Basically, we take into consideration the common or standard operations. Say, for example, straight in approach, an approach with three degree glide path with, 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 a, with a standard uh, procedure. So these are the factors which have been taken into consideration and we have decided, okay, for this kind of an approach, which is standard, which is quite common, let's define this obstacle-free surfaces. So that's how the dimensions of these obstacle-free surfaces have been arrived at. That is a big topic to discuss about how we arrived at the dimensions of the obstacle-free surfaces, like the width of the inner edge of the approach surface. Is it going to be 280 meters less? Yes, there are going to be some changes. A lot of data analysis, data churning has been done by this group close to around 135,000 aircraft approaches, especially their, their, their deviations around the threshold have been analyzed and based on which the dimensions of these surfaces have been arrived at. So this is going to be a hard surface, which means you need to establish this surface. States shall establish this surface, but there are going to be some modifications if required, depending on the slope. So quickly moving on, the basic principle, as I had mentioned earlier, it is for those operations which cannot adapt to any variations. So the OFS shall be established. Say, for example, you need to have an approach. You need to have a go-round. You need to have a back landing. You need to have a takeoff climb surfaces, say, for example. So if you look at the picture to your right, the blue surfaces are your approach, transitional, and takeoff climb surfaces. They are mainly to protect from obstacles, fixed and mobile, mainly fixed obstacles. Whereas if you look at the red surface, which is the inner approach, inner transition, and the bark landing surface, they are predominantly to protect fixed and mobile objects. It's something similar to the OFZ, which we are using in nowadays, something similar to that. So, so these are the kind of changes that you can envisage in the upcoming uh, revisions. So quickly moving on to obstacle evaluation surfaces. These are something which is beyond the obstacle-free surfaces. Obstacle-free surfaces are hard surfaces. Obstacle evaluation surfaces are surfaces which are beyond the obstacle-free surfaces. They act as a trigger. A state or an industry can decide whether they want to have this obstacle evaluation surfaces based on the type of operation. Suppose if you're if you're having a, a circling approach, you may need to have a special OES. If not, you may not need to have it. If you have an obstacle on one side of the runway, you have circling approach in, in only on one side of, of, your, of your runway, which means you can modify your OES accordingly. So these OES act as a trigger. They give us an alert. If an obstacle is going to penetrate the OES, yes, we need to be careful and do something about it, which is what I'm going to touch upon in the aeronautical study. So moving forward, what can you expect in the obstacle evaluation surface? There are basically three options. In the proposals, we may give you some kind of a standard OES with some standard dimensions, which covers the generic type of operations. A state can take them and say that, okay, let's use this as an OES. There is another option for a state who may also decide Okay, I may have an obstacle evaluation surface OES as an obstacle free surface, hard surface, if they want to be overprotective. Or a state or an industry may decide to modify the obstacle evaluation surfaces depending on the type of operations. We give some standard dimensions. 
there is a possibility to vary these standard dimensions depending on the type of operations. The third possibility is to have your own obstacle evaluation surface. So this is the extent of flexibility provided in the obstacle evaluation surfaces. So moving forward, we have been talking uh, about uh, OFS and OES. How are these OFS and OES determined? They are determined based on what we call as the aeroplane design group. Yes, it's a bit of a, a change, a kind of a paradigm shift from what we have been doing in the aeroplane uh, reference code, ARC, uh, aerodrome reference code. From there, we are trying to move towards the aeroplane uh, design group. Why are we doing this? Because this is important when it comes to the flight procedure design. One of the important parameters which is taken into consideration is the approach speed. So this aircraft approach speed or the indicated airspeed at threshold is one of the key parameters for the procedure designers. So in order to harmonize and bring uh, uniformity, this has been taken into consideration along with the aeroplane wingspan. So these are the two criteria which determine what an ADG is all about. So I'm just giving you a quick snapshot of how this is going to look like. I know there will be a lot of questions, the transition, how we are going to do it, so on and so forth. So this is just an indication of what to expect. A few states, if I'm not wrong, FAA and Transport Canada are already using this kind of aeroplane design group. So there are seven categories or, or seven groups based on the indicated airspeed and the wingspan. Of course, I understand that there will be a lot of questions, anxiety, whether how to use this. For the time being, this is going to be used only for chapter four of Annex 14, which is on OLS. The rest of the chapters, if they are going to continue the ARC, there may be some discussions later on whether to come completely revamp the entire Annex 14 to have everything as ADG. But for the time being, it is chapter four of Annex 14, which is going to talk about this particular grouping. Uh, there are, I, uh, we have been used to this kind of grouping because for the rescue and firefighting, we have a separate group. For the design of the parameters, we have a separate group. We have the outer main gear wheel span used for something else. So yes, we are used to it. It is a challenge. We understand it will take a bit of a teething uh, time for us to understand. So how do you plan for it? It's it's not as difficult as what we think. For the If you look at this particular thing based on the local factors, what are the expected aircraft operations, you have the standard wingspan. And based on this, you need to look at the reference field length or the indicated airspeed at threshold based on which you decide the aeroplane design group and the reference field length. I just wanted to highlight that it's not that difficult. If you look, the top uh, row is, is, is on, on the code number, which we have one, two, three, and four. And, and, and the bottom one is on the ADG or the aeroplane design group. So we have kind of identified the, the synergies between these two. So it may take a bit of time for us to get used to it. However, it's not a, a, a very difficult thing for us to implement it. And since we are talking about OFS, OES, there are a lot of confusions, whether states should implement OES, whether they can change the OFS, there are a lot of questions. So what we are planning to do is to have a new chapter in PANS aerodromes on obstacle control and evaluation. So in this aeronautical study is one of the important topics that we intend to include. So we all know what an aeronautical study is. It is to examine the aeronautical concerns by assessing the impact and if required, provide mitigation measures. There are several triggers for based on which these uh, aeronautical studies are conducted, which most of us are aware of. So this particular guidelines was going to provide the details. In fact, we are going to see some examples of how this is being conducted in one of the states in the subsequent presentation. We know about the stakeholders involved in the aeronautical study the AV Civil Aviation Authority. In fact, this particular chapter is also going to talk about the way civil aviation authorities can assign responsibilities to different stakeholders when it comes to construction of obstacles or evaluating, defining the OES and OFS. So I'm not going to go through the list of this. In the chapter, the details will be provided. So this is just a, a, a quick idea or, or the flow chart of how an aeronautical study needs to be conducted. The details will be in the chapter. So there'll be a trigger, 
what kind of data needs to be gathered, what kind of surveys need to be conducted, how an impact assessment used to be done, what is the impact, whether there is a possibility of identifying mitigations, acceptable, so on and so forth. So these are the kind of details that you'll be trying to get in pan zero rooms and additional guidance material. So there, is it just an X14? No, there are quite a lot of documents which will have an impact, of course, the major change is going to be NX14 volume one, chapter four has been is going to be completely rewritten. Because of this, there may be consequential amendments in NX4 on, on aeronautical charts and NX15, AIM. Of course, there is going to be a bit of changes because OLS, the term OLS, which we've been using now includes OFS and OES. So these two together constitute an OLS. So so this particular change is definitely going to have a mild consequential impact on other annexes and pan aircraft operations. We are completely rewriting the Airport Services Manual Part 6 to facilitate these new changes. Moving forward, this is the question which will be there in most of our minds. When is this going to happen? So as I had mentioned, we have almost finalized this particular concept we are, we are trying to write it down and, 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 and do the editorial things by the end of this year. So the preliminary review by the Air Navigation Commission, that is the highest technical body of IKO, will happen during the first quarter of 2023. After that, a state letter will be issued, say, for example, somewhere by the end or the beginning of Q2 2023, around April 2023. That is an opportunity for states and international organizations to respond to us with your queries. Please do look into the state letter, come up with your questions or queries so that we can review it. So based on the feedback received from all of you, we will again do the final review and it will go for the council adoption in 2025. So we expect to have the effective date by July 2025 and the applicability date in November 2028. One of the reasons that we deliberated is that states may require more time for this. So we felt that at least a minimum of three years needs to be given for states from the effective to the applicability dates, because this may involve changing their local laws, their national legislation, so on and so forth. So for all practical purposes, again, this is a tentative timeline. We are not sure in case if the ANC or the council have got a different view, the timelines may slightly get changed. However, for all practical purposes, we expect this to be applicable in November 2028. So yes, when we do this, it's a big change, big shift. We will work with regional offices in terms of how to enhance the awareness and cooperation between all the counterparts, including the industry, to take this OLS related matters. Future OLS workshops, this is just a tip of the iceberg what you're seeing this webinar. We'll have some detailed seminars or workshops with the regional offices for the implementation. We'll have targeted courses, training courses, so that this is effectively implemented. So that's all from my side. Thank you. We'll be happy to take any questions. Over to you. RC, muchísimas gracias por... RC, thank you very much for your presentation. It has been very clear. In the Q&A, there was a question on the timelines. I believe that this is a concern raised by many. And even though it is a long time, we are also talking about several changes. That is why we have begun informing of what has been approved and what comes next. Thank you very much, RC. Next, I would like to give the floor to our colleague, Diago Marquez. Just give me one second, please. While Tiago gets ready for his presentation. Yes, good morning. Uh, Tiago, just give me one minute to introduce you. Tiago, was trained in air traffic control and air traffic management by the Brazilian Air Force, acquiring experience in several areas of the Department of Aerospace Control, known as DESEA. 
such as air traffic control, ACC, APP, and TWR air traffic control, air traffic flow management, design of flight procedures, air navigation service providers, ANSP inspections, aeronautical accident investigations, among others. Uh, he, 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 is, he has been involved in air drone obstacle control since 2003 and participated in the development of regulatory documents and in the establishment of processes that guide the AGA subject within the SEA and also within the region. Uh, Thiago is an active participant of the regional panels under the regional system. He is a Brazilian member of the OLS task force or the obstacle limitation surface task force and has participated in the ATM OPS and adopt panels of ICAO Montreal as an ICAO airdrome expert and also from the regional system. Uh, Thiago, thank you very much. Over to you. I think you are muted, Thiago. Hello, friends. Yes, can you see my screen? Yes, I mean, we can see where it says Configuración de visualización. Can you please click on that so we can see your full screen? Because we are also seeing the additional information. Is it better? Yes. Much better. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon. But I believe there's no one in a night time zone, so no need to say good evening. Thank you very much, Fabio, for your introductory remarks. It is an honor and a pleasure to participate in this event and to share with you the work that we have been doing for almost eight years now in this area of uh, obstacle control and airdromes. To be honest with you, I will deliver this presentation in my broken Spanish. I've been given one hour, but I believe that the interpreters are prepared for this. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to reach an understanding. As a way of introduction, to uh, the obstacle control around airdromes. I always like to start my presentations around OLS with this image. What we are trying to address here is to find, to strike this balance, how to strike a balance between the establishment of an airport and the benefits brought about to a region with the development of the city where the airport was built. The importance of aviation for social and economic areas requires constant improvement of mechanisms to promote coordination between civil aviation authorities, airdrome operators, and other state agencies involved in obstacle control surrounding the airdromes. Here I am sharing with you a potential methodology which country can vary extensively the way in which they address this issue. Most importantly, I want you to focus on the roles played at each stage as state approves a national or domestic legislation which provides guidelines for the entire process. There are four stakeholders involved. The first one is the airdrome operator by planning its airdrome and establishing the corresponding services. And it should also keep on surveying or monitoring uh, the surfaces. The second player or stakeholder is the Civil Aviation Authority who should analyze, approve, and pu publish the OFS and OAES of each airdrome under their responsibility. The third stakeholder is the competent local authority, which should know 
the services of all airdromes approved by the Civil Aviation Authority and they need to use the zoning process and also to issue authorization for a new building construction or facility. The last stakeholder is the proposer. It is usually a foreign entity, someone who doesn't know anything about aviation. And uh, this individual or this entity needs to obtain approval before they start building something in a specific area. Now, let us imagine the case of a municipal authority which is managing an airport. In this case, the municipal authority should carry out the actions of the first player or stakeholder, developing the surfaces to await for the approval of the Civil Aviation Authority, and finally, to act with a third party, this external third party, by promoting authorizations for new buildings or constructions. I would like to, I let me ask you, how is uh, that they are going to develop item number one to establish the surface limitation, the obstacle limitation surface? The origin of the surface uh, relies on airport planning, first and foremost, and we can establish the following steps. The first one is the traffic planning. Which aircraft are going to be flying there? Number two, the operation planning. We are going to have an instrument-based operation or a visual operation. The third one is the definition of the CRA, Air Reference Code, ARC. The fourth point is the planning of a navigation aids. Point number five, the design of the obstacle limitation surfaces. Number six, conduction of a topographic survey identification of obstacles on the surfaces, then design of air navigation procedures. Number eight, adaptation of the local peculiarities. It's interesting here to understand more about the aeronautical studies, which will be explained later on. Number nine, surveillance of the air drone protection areas. Now, let us learn more about surfaces. Our friend RC already mentioned this, but I will provide further details. The current surfaces, back in the 1950s, a number of amendments were incorporated, and this can be seen on this image. Today, we do not clearly understand the purpose of each surface, protecting surface. In several cases, we see OLS that do not protect the approach or takeoff procedures, as you can see on this marking in orange or yellow. Not sure. An obstacle on this position would not be interfering with the OLS. However, it would affect the procedure. And to improve the scenario, the task force brings this following proposal. At first, the OLS task force work began by analyzing statistical and mathematical information. We obtained data from 35 airports with the ASDEX system. Airport Surface Detection Equipment Model X system, which is a type of radar. A number of, well, over 130 approach paths were analyzed, 60 takeoff paths, and over 15 discontinued approaches and missed approaches were conducted. But with after con completing this work, a date were not concluding. There was no strong correlation between the expected variables. Sometimes we find the need of changing another criterion, a parameter. So we started working on a line of work in order to support this idea. The group reached a consensus, but other groups 
uh, didn't support our idea. So it was a lot of work coming and going, and we finally arrived at this type of material that we are presenting. It is important to point out that between these comes and goes, we didn't lose sight of our key objective in our work. The idea has always been to establish a minimum uh, space volume that preserves accessibility of the airdrome and the safety of air operations that provides protection of aircraft during approaches, rejected takeoffs, and bulked landings, and also to determine a specific purpose for each surface. The task force proposed a double concept of surfaces to ensure that safety and accessibility of all the potential aircraft operations at the airdrome are fulfilled as effectively as possible without representing an unnecessary impact on other stakeholders external to aviation, such as the operators or the developers. At the same time, the concept proposed would guarantee clarity on the purpose and applicability of these surfaces. The OLS uh, TF found some similarities in the paths of the aircraft in areas close to the runway threshold where the operations of the aircraft usually follow the same path and it is very likely that the impact of obstacles on their operations is unacceptable. So much so, the dimensions of the surfaces should allow accessibility to all the foreseen flight operations. The OLS dimensions should provide the necessary protection, sufficient protection for all of the anticipated operations. The OLS that implicitly know the different impacts of obstacles that obstacles could have on operations. OLS should not impose restrictions and necessary restrictions in this area. The surface proposed by the task force has been designed with stringent obstacle requirements to ensure a space that is free of obstacles that could affect, that could have a negative impact on the flight operations. Therefore, we have the two surfaces here, the obstacle-free surface, which aims at providing a necessary airspace volume for safety and accessibility of operations surrounding the runway where the operations cannot adapt to obstacles present there. The obstacle-free surfaces primarily ensure the safety and security of aircraft in the visual phase of approaches where there is a need to stabilize the operations and since it is approaching the threshold, it requires no obstacles present there. This purpose is similar to the current purpose of the obstacle limitation surface established in DOC 9137. Obstacle evaluation surfaces guarantee that the procedures, that the instrument procedures are accessible and safe for their use in the existing operations and uh, the operations anticipated in the airdromes as such surfaces ensure the safety of uh, takeoff operations. The surfaces are designed to give count of the variability of operations and they act as a trigger of an aeronautical study. We try to change as less as possible the other aspect, but this was a critical aspect and we needed to work on it. The current OLS use a airdrome reference key as a basis to design obstacle limitation surfaces. This airdrome reference key is much more related to the dimensions of the critical aircraft that operate at the airdrome and do not fulfill very well the operational criteria. The 
categorization adopted for developing procedures for air navigation based on the threshold airspeed would not address the need for review proposed by the OLS task force. So we consider the need of merging both concepts, bringing the concept of a DG airplane design group, airplane, airplane design group. The intention of the ADG is to provide a simple method to interrelate the specifications for the management of obstacles around the airdromes. The design group uses two criteria which are related to the performance characteristics and to the dimensions of the aircraft. The first criteria is based on the airspeed of the airspeed at threshold, and the second criteria is related to the wingspan of the airplane. This group wishes to first identify the aircraft for which this runway has been designed, and then it should determine it should determine which is the most demanding one. We will also determine a design group for each runway in accordance with the characteristics of the airplane for which this runway is intended to. The purpose of the group was to propose a classification of aircraft, which is consistent with the performance and the size of the aircraft in order to have similar surface for similar aircraft in terms of operations and size. And consistent with the current classification in numbers of code to facilitate transition from the existing classification. With respect to the first objective, this GDA was able to establish that the aircraft classified in each design group share similar behaviors in terms of flight and can be covered by identical surfaces. On this image, you can see how the mathematical conception of the separation, but evidently we propose other qualitative criteria during the development of the proposal. Just a few aircraft can pass code number one to group design two alpha or higher, and from code number two to GDA to Charlie or higher. This means that very few airplanes or aircraft, I mean, uh, the runways where uh, the aircraft use should be the most demanding, they need to require more demanding services. As a way of an example, let me share with you this information on the ATR-72, which is a widely used company by the Sioux Company for regional flights here in Brazil. On green, you can see the reference field length for the aircraft and the wingspan. And in blue, you can see the airspeed at threshold and the wingspan. If we go back to the tables, we will find the code number reference number, which is Charlie and to Bravo, which is the ATG to, to Bravo. Well, now let us look at the surfaces. As we have said, the OFS should consider operations that uh, cannot adapt easily to the obstacles. And this could be bulk landing, rejected takeoffs, etc. This will provide a comprehensive means to avoid these obstacles. So for this, there is a need to introduce and to enforce those aircraft, those surfaces that address these obstacles in any type of runway. How can we allow for fixed objects in the same distance of uh, the runway as mobile uh, objects? We are proposing different surfaces to limit both a fixed and mobile objects. The transitional surface will continue to be using in terms of control of fixed objects. The approach and takeoff surface will be free of both mobile and fixed uh, objects as to the surfaces uh, dedicated to prevent mobile objects, its purpose should be consistent with the OFS, existing OFS. 
So the obstacle free areas or OFS should have the objective of not only limiting fixed objects, but also mobile objects to ensure the protection of uh, aircraft, those flying at low altitude where the aircraft can fly at low altitude and a mobile object can be a threat. These surfaces would consist of the same OFS surfaces that already exist, the internal approach and the bulk landing surface. In terms of impact, the introduction of new surfaces for the limitation of mobile objects in runways, which are non-precision runways and visual flight runways should not cause impacts on different airdromes since the surfaces have taken into account the holding positions and there shouldn't be any effects on the dimensions of these holding points. So the location of the holding point in the runway should be such that the aircraft and the holding vehicle do not infringe the inner approach surface and the bulk landing surface. It is worth mentioning that the new surfaces would not affect the dimensions of the existing holding points. Now let's take a look at each surface. First of all, approach. The purpose of the approach surface is to establish the airspace that must be kept free of obstacles in order to protect an aircraft in the visual phase of the approach maneuvers for landing after a standard approach of three degrees. The three degree slope is applied to most approaches, therefore it's used as a hypothesis for the design of approach surfaces. When the slope is different for a local reason, the approach slope can be adjusted, but the slope must not increase to facilitate the growth of obstacles. The distance of the threshold is like the existing ones. The dimension of the inner uh, VOR was defined by the, the length of the inner edge is shown here. Also, the slope is 500 feet and the slope is consistent with the VSS visual segment surface and with the slope of instrument uh, runways. This is a simulated comparison of the change of surfaces prepared by the French colleague in the group in an instrument and non-precision runway that would uh, move from code three to, to Charlie design group. In blue, the current approach and in orange, the new one. And regarding the transition surfaces, their purpose is to establish the volume of airspace that must be kept free of fixed obstacles in order to protect an aircraft when overflying the runway or in missed approach of a three degree standard approach beyond the approach surface. Practically, the transition surface covers the volume of airspace that is needed in order to protect the aircraft that descend to the runway in the uh, climb path of a missed approach where the approach, where the uh, approach uh, um, surface does not pr provide protection. Uh, the upper limit is uh, 60 meters. Uh, it's considered enough to protect the aircraft uh, that reach uh, 150 meters altitude, which is the altitude that is maintained uh, for the protection of uh, the aircraft in the visual phase uh, for landing. In visual uh, runways and approaches that are non-precision, the slope of the transition surface will not exceed 20%. 
this is the comparison in blue, the current transition, and in orange, the new transition. Inner approach. The inner approach surface protects an aircraft against fixed and mobile obstacles before the threshold. In the descent phase of uh, bolt landing or in missed approach uh, maneuvers after a standard approach of the three degrees, the inner approach surface maintains the descent phase before the threshold while the remaining parts in the, the climb phase are protected by the inner transition surface. The inner approach uh, surface, it, in addition to protecting aircraft against the fixed obstacles, it also protects uh, operations against the mobile obstacles. It's not necessary to specify the slope of the surface since uh, the inner approach surface is included in the approach surface. In our comparison, the current inner approach in orange, uh, the new one that we will have in non-precision aerodromes. Inner transition. The purpose is to establish the airspace that must be kept free of, of fixed and mobile obstacles to protect an aircraft in the climb a phase of a bulk landing or in missed approach maneuvers after a standard approach of three degrees beyond the inner approach surface. In runways for non-instrument approach and for non-precision approaches, the inner transition surface has been introduced. Therefore, they have to be compatible with the existing parameters rather than imposing unnecessary restrictions. The inner transition surface tries to limit mobile obstacles in addition to fixed obstacles along the runway. The principle considered in the design of the surface ensures that the impact of the mobile obstacle proposed will not be greater than the impact of having vehicles and aircraft in the runway holding points at present. The surface is designed to start in the holding position. This ensures that mobile obstacles are limited to the same requirements of the aircraft and the vehicles in the holding positions. In our comparison, in blue, the current transition, and in orange, the inner transition. Bulk landing. The bulk landing surface is aimed at establishing the volume of airspace that must be kept free of fixed and mobile obstacles in order to protect an aircraft in the climb phase of a bulk landing or in missed approach maneuvers after a standard approach of three degrees beyond the inner transition surface. It is designed to be implemented in precision approach runways where the bulk landing can start at low altitude over the threshold in, in the climb phase is not necessarily covered by the inner transition surface. In our example, we won't have that surface because we don't have a precision uh, operations. Takeoff. The purpose of uh, the takeoff surface is to establish the volume of airspace where obstacles can have an impact on the aircraft operation limitations during takeoff under non-critical conditions. The design of uh, the takeoff surface is consistent with uh, the uh, obstacle clearance uh, uh, requirements uh, according to document 10064 
and annex six uh, the total dimension also considers uh, the charge of uh, uh, annex four uh, aerodrome obstacle charge the slope of the takeoff surface must be adjustable based on the operational characteristics of the aircraft operating at the aerodrome and local conditions. But in such adjustment, regarding such adjustment, the group recognized that it's important to consult with the airlines and the pilots. It's still the responsibility of the pilot to ensure free clearance of obstacles and uh, take uh, in in takeoff uh, both in operations with full engines uh, or in case of abnormal conditions uh, for instance extreme weather conditions and emergency conditions the slope of uh, the takeoff surface can be adjusted uh, to aircraft operations where the climb and takeoff characteristics are such uh, that they don't need a three percent slope However, this slope is not for uh, allowing for the growth of obstacles. The specifications of uh, the climb and takeoff uh, uh, characteristics appears in uh, the pants ops. Our comparison in blue, the takeoff surface, and in gray, uh, not orange, I don't know why, the new one, the new takeoff surface. Obstacle evaluation surfaces. Why do we need uh, additional surfaces? Well, basically because of the variety of uh, flight procedures in an aerodrome can be enormous. And operations may be quite different from one aerodrome to another. Thus, the objective of the OES is to provide the volume of airspace where obstacles might affect operations and where their impact needs to be assessed. It's important to note that the penetration of an OES triggers an aeronautical study. The principles adopted by the task force were OES uh, are uh, proposed with the standard dimensions to cover the most common types of operations. The OES can be modified in terms with respect to standard dimensions uh, to address operations with uh, uh, local specificities and OES uh, can be adopted with specific characteristics and dimensions. As a way of facilitating the work uh, of, uh, for the OES, the group developed uh, four services that will be applied in most of the cases. Let me talk about each surface. The horizontal surface is aimed at uh, protecting the airspace for uh, flight procedures and uh, uh, transit uh, patterns. It also provides a certain protection for visual patterns and uh, terminal flight procedures, including PBN approaches. Uh, missed approach with the early turns. The design of the horizontal surface is compatible with the dimensions of the maneuvering, of visual maneuvering area foreseen in PANSOPS. The outer limits of the horizontal surface um, um, must be circular with entry of uh, the thresholds uh, linked with uh, straight lines. The height will be measured above uh, the elevation of the airdrome. Going back to our comparison in blue, the horizontal surface and uh, in the inner horizontal surface and in green, the conical surface and in orange, uh, the new horizontal surface. 
serve as uh, for direct instrument approaches. The purpose of uh, this uh, uh, surface is to define the volume of airspace where obstacles may have an impact in the uh, strays in uh, approaches uh, with instruments where the horizontal surface or part of it has not been established. Uh, as a, since a single OES cannot address all the uh, instrument approach procedures, we only consider uh, strays in instrument uh, approaches that are the most common, unlike the precision approaches, which include uh, strays in approaches, VOR approaches, and also uh, visual patterns are considered. In our comparison, in blue, the inner horizontal surface, and in orange, the new surface for the straight in approaches. Surface for a precision approaches. The purpose is to establish the volume of air space where obstacles may have an impact on common straight in precision approach procedures using ILS, MLS, uh, GBAS, or SBAS CAT1. The design of the surface is consistent with the dimension of the, the ILS uh, basic uh, surface uh, pre uh, presented in PANSOP. The basic surface specified in document 816A established an airspace that is appropriate to ensure the accessibility of the runway and the precision approaches. The use of the basic ILS uh, surface is the most simple uh, method uh, mentioned in document 816A is uh, to be used in calculating obstacle clearance uh, altitude. And here we have no comparison. Instrument departure surface. The purpose of this surface is to establish the volume of airspace where obstacles may have an impact on the aircraft after an, an omnidirectional instrument departure procedure. The design of this surface is consistent with the dimensions provided in PANSOPS. The takeoff surface defines the airspace necessary for identifying obstacles that may affect uh, obstacle clearance related to the provisions of Annex 6. However, uh, this uh, clearance is not enough uh, to provide uh, instrument uh, approaches and the obstacles that are below the takeoff surface might affect the accessibility of uh, instrument departures. For this reason, it's necessary to have an and OES to ensure the accessibility of the runway to aircraft that will conduct instrument departures. It's interesting to note that the elevation of the inner edge is five meters above the center line of the runway and is consistent with the inner edge of OES. identified in the pants ops. In our comparison, in blue, the current takeoff surface, in orange, the new instrument takeoff surface. Modification of OES, basically. Modifications are required for uh, operations that vary in situations where there is uh, no uh, traffic pattern is not necessary to establish the total length of uh, the surface. When the, the approach is not allowed in the uh, given surface or a runway, uh, this can be allowed. Sometimes the minima for circling are not used due to the terrain or to the obstacles around the airdrome. In such cases, the height of the horizontal uh, surface can be increased so that it will coincide with the, the optical clearance altitude based on the minima, minimum requirements. 
OES, specific OES. It may happen. These may happen with the uh, current uh, ones that do not uh, uh, specify the volume of airspace necessary for the identification and evaluation of obstacles that may have an impact on certain operations. It may be necessary, for instance, uh, for instrument approach procedures based on NDB or radar uh, uh, that it straight in uh, procedures uh, with a low minima uh, uh, instrument uh, approach procedures and approach uh, procedures with instruments in uh, uh, curves. Now, a summary of uh, the uh, proposed uh, OES. We have OES uh, with standard dimensions to cover the most uh, common operations. OES can be modified and the specific OES uh, can be adopted and uh, breaches or penetrations of an OES uh, trigger an aeronautical study. A general summary of the surfaces, the OFS will be established for non-instrument runways or for non-precision approaches in approach transition, inner approach and inner transition. For precision approaches, the approach of surface, transition, inner approach surface, inner transition, and bolt landing. When the runway is uh, for takeoff, uh, the takeoff surface will also be established. And uh, the OES should uh, be established in case of a circling approach, the horizontal surface in the case of straight in instrument approach that are non-precision when the horizontal surface cannot, has not been established straight in instrument uh, approaches. The, uh, and also in case of instrument departure procedure, the instrument departure surface. Objects outside of uh, the obstacle-free surfaces and obstacle evaluation surfaces in areas beyond the limits of uh, the uh, OLS, at least those obstacles that extend to 100 meters should be considered unless an aeronautical study uh, show that they are not, not a hazard for flight operations. Well, finally, we have this study on the aeronautical study, although uh, this is the topic that they asked me the most. I will not talk about aeronautical study. I will uh, to Francisco to run his own show, but I am leaving a message which is critical to better understand the work and also for future work related to obstacle control at aerodromes. It doesn't matter how perfect the work of uh, developing obstacle limitation surfaces is. In a specific case, in a specific place, at some point, penetrations are going to occur. All the penetrations or obstacles will be necessary due to a public or economic interest. And in that moment, there will be a need to conduct an aeronautical study. Well, this is what I wanted to present to you. Thank you very much. Molto obrigado. Thank you very much, Tiago, for your explanation. There are a number of questions left on the Q&A box. We will answer them next. And if any of these questions cannot be answered by our panelists, for the audience to know, we will be sharing this with the panelists so they can answer your questions later on and they can publish the result of these questions on the web page. Well, for those colleagues who are writing to us, please feel assured that we are looking at your questions. Thank you very much, Diago, for your presentation. We are uh, doing well in terms of time, so we have uh, the option of uh, taking Francisco's presentation now. And after Francisco's presentation, we can have a small coffee break. Francisco, I don't know if you are ready for your presentation or you rather we take a 10 minute break and then we can come back.
Hello, Fabio. Good morning, everybody. As you wish. I can do my presentation now, or since we have uh, been uh, listening to other presentations for a while. We can take a quick break and then I'll continue afterwards. Okay, let us do the following. Let us take a 10 minute break. And at 10 o'clock Lima time, we can start with your presentation. Is that okay? Great, 10 minute break then. See you soon.
okay. Volvemos a, a la sesión. Okay, we are back in our session. Francisco, are you still there? Okay, thank you. So, a little bit more refreshed. Uh, let us continue with your presentation. Let me quickly introduce Francisco. Francisco is uh, the head of the Aeronautical Studies Department, AESA, which is a Spanish Aviation Security and Safety Agency. He's an aeronautical engineer with more than 12 years of experience in aeronautical studies. Francisco started his professional career working for private companies as project manager in several airports. In 2008, he joined the Aviation Safety and Security State Agency and specialized in the analysis of the effect of obstacles on flight procedures and navigation radio electric facilities. In this context, he has collaborated in several regulatory projects on obstacle control. He has been a member of the Eurocontrol Terrain and Obstacle Data Working Group and is currently a member of the ICAO Obstacle Limitation Services Task Force Working Group. So we have a true specialist here on aeronautical studies and he will present the experience in Spain. Francisco, over to you. Thank you very much, Fabio, for giving me the opportunity for introducing me and for giving me the opportunity to present our aeronautical studies in Spain. Let me tell you more about how we conduct studies in Spain as a way of managing obstacle control by a civil aviation authority. I will begin my uh, presentation by explaining the domestic regulatory framework. Then I will talk about the different stakeholders involved in the process and the role they play. Finally, I will explain the methodology that we use to carry out this type of studies. Well, the first important issue that needs to be considered is that the state, or there is a need in order to properly manage and control obstacles, there's a need to have a regulation. We need to implement domestic regulations to do an effective control. In our case, in Spain, it is mandatory to request for authorization to the state aviation safety agency in two assumptions, under two assumptions, when the obstacle is within areas that we call protection areas which is the aeronautical easement uh, independent from the obstacle altitude. And if the obstacle has an altitude of over 100 meters or a height of over 100 meters, we also need authorization. Across the country, we have defined a number of surfaces that you can see on the image in the bottom to protect both the airports and the radio, the air navigation, the radio electrical facilities in remote areas. The protection surfaces that we use consist of two sets of surfaces which are based on ICAO documents in Annex 14 and in the guidance material on radioelectrical facilities that was developed by the European region, the EUR DOC 015. Additionally, in our case, in addition to these surfaces, in our country we have defined protection surfaces to provide protection to the procedures in areas that are more remote, far away from the airport. As uh, pointed out in the previous presentations, the defined surfaces in Annex 14, which are defined in order to provide protection to the procedures, and the surfaces defined in the EUR DOC 15, which are defined to protect the proper functioning and operation of the air navigation or radioelectric facilities. In both cases, the characteristics of each surface, the geometry, the scope or extension and the slope depend on the purpose of the surface. What are these surfaces designed for? Which area they are protecting from the operational perspective? We are planning to protect approach take off approaching circuit and to protect the uh, CNS uh, surfaces. We aim at the proper functioning of the VOR, ELS, radar. These are the radioelectric facilities. In Spain, we have published in our website that you can see the link here on the top part of my slide. 
we have published all the protection surfaces available in different formats. We have also published what we call a web map where uh, the requesters can look at the limits of the easement to see where is it that they need to request authorization. In red, what you can see in red would be the limits of uh, the surfaces according to Annex 14 and UR 15 to protect radioelectric facilities and in bloom uh, the involving uh, that we use to protect procedures in areas far away from the airports. As I pointed out before, the airports and facilities have their own code represented also on the web map. And what I was saying is that this is a good tool to look at the limits of the serve of the easement and see where is it that we need to ask for authorization. The official blueprint or plans are available in PDF format. And what we are showing here is the projection of the in section of the transitional surface. In blue, you can see the protection of the ELS and the circles represent protection surfaces of radioelectric facilities. This information is also available in UAVLG. This allows the promoters to develop their projects where you can see the slope, the level curves, and also in Google Earth. Here you can see an example of surfaces under Annex 14, a terrain area where the terrain is infringing the conical surface. And as I was saying, this is a useful information for developers to know to what extent they can build without penetrating the protection surfaces. Each level curve, as you can see there, has a maximum allowed altitude. Let me now explain about the process for the approval of obstacles. In our case, the process is defined as follows. When an individual, a person or a company wishes to carry out a construction or develop a project, the first thing they do is to go to the city council. The city council is the one which resubmits this request with all the necessary data to the civil aviation authority, the state aviation safety agency and the city council cannot issue the approval for construction until receiving the approval of the civil aviation authority the agency evaluates the request received from the city council and if there is a need to carry out an aeronautical study they make arrangements with the manager or the administrator of the airdrome and the air navigation service provider to carry out any necessary studies in some cases there is a need to carry out a specific studies on the potential impact of what we are requesting for for instance uh, the correct uh, operation of the facilities and we require the study either from the manager or administrator of the airdrome or the air navigation service provider and the process ends with the issuance of an administrative decision which could be favorable or unfavorable and in this we include uh, the conditions under which they can carry out the necessary actions or the requested actions sorry Based on our experience, we think that it's important to underscore that there is a need to have to have automated most of the process, especially in large countries where we receive a high number of requests. For you to have an idea, we in Spain receive uh, currently around uh, 12,000 requests per year on average that we need to evaluate and a large part of these requests require an aeronautical study that we need to conduct. A while ago, we used to do everything on paper. We would receive the paper-based request and the decisions were issued on paper. But in the last few years, we have automated the whole process and the procedures are done in a telematic manner using the electronic office. The developer goes to the city council with his information and data and through the electronic office, the city council processes a request with the agency and the agency through a number of IT applications. They carry out the evaluation or assessment, and they also issue the decision or resolution, which is also sent electronically. As to the aeronautical studies, uh, the process that we follow for them, the first step of the aeronautical study is to carry out an evaluation of the penetration of protection surfaces. 
Whenever there is penetration of such protection surface, there is a need to carry out an aeronautical study. In terms of impacts on radioelectrical facilities or on the operations, which in this case has associated protection surfaces, but there are cases where we are planning to carry out actions that do not violate or infringe their protection surfaces, but however, we do require study to analyze any potential impacts. For instance, the reconstruction of solar plants, now with the development of clean energy, we increasingly receive a more request for those type of facilities. In that case, there is a need to make sure that no reflections might be caused that, that could harm or damage, that could affect the aircraft or the potential attraction of fauna that might lead to the development of certain facilities, which could be dumps or dumpsters that might attract fauna that may entail a risk. The impact in each of the well, the impact in the operations and the radio electrical facilities is done following a specific methodology. The methodology that we follow to analyze the potential impacts on the operations and radio electric facilities is a very specific methodology uh, in this presentation. And in terms of the aeronautical study concept related to the impact of OLS, it is focused mainly on the operational part, but then there is uh, there are other impacts that we need to analyze following another specific methodology, such as the radioelectric impact, the analysis of potential reflections, or the attraction of fauna. As to the analysis of the operational impact, the first step that we take is to collect data. On the one hand side, there is a need to collect all the data related to the procedures published, not only those procedures implemented by the airport, but many times the limitations imposed on the procedures established for en route flights. Because do not forget, especially nowadays with the development of wind energy, which includes proposals to build wind farms with a higher of over 200 to 150 meters, it is important to take into account that these obstacles can affect, and they do affect air navigation procedures, uh, procedure phases or sections that are located in remote area, the minimum sector altitudes, airways, these are things that we need to take into account. On the one hand side, we have all the data on the procedures that may be affected, but on the other, we need to collect data on the obstacles. So we need to have a precise definition of all of the obstacle data with respect to their coordinates, their geometry, and their elevation. The aeronautical study proposed to analyze potential impacts on operations should include two types of analysis. The one that covers the procedures carried out according to the instrumental flight rules and those that cover the procedures regarding visual flight rules. Uh, the principles to analyze these two procedures are different and the methodology to be followed is also different for both IFR and BFR. We should include the contingency procedures in this type of study. Well, around uh, the working group at ICAO, they have extensively discussed whether as part of a methodology, we need to include contingency procedures. And this is something that depends also on the state. In our particular case, the contingency procedures are not part of this type of study, they fall under the responsibility of the operator taking into account the existing obstacles that have been published in the AIP. As to the analysis of procedures carried out under instrumental flight rules, these are carried out following the methodology specified in document 8168 also known as the so-called PANSOPS. The principles under this methodology state that each instrument procedure has its protection area, and it 
has been designed considering a uh, margin of obstacle clearance that cannot be penetrated at any time if in order not to affect the procedure. In terms of the type of procedure and segment, uh, the obstacle clearance margin in the lateral areas could be less restrictive than in the primary area. As I said, uh, the, the obstacle clearance margin, this depends on the type of procedure and also depends on the segment of the procedure. This is in terms of the procedures carried out according to instrumental flight rules. For this type of procedures, Occasionally, it is evident that the obstacle we are evaluating remains outside the protection surfaces. However, in many cases, there is a need to draw the protection surfaces in order to demonstrate that the obstacle falls inside or outside these protection surfaces and whether a penetration is happening. The drawing of these protection surfaces can be done by using a specialized software, but it can also be done using a CAD software. In any case, what is important here is that this work, taking into account the analysis that has been conducted, this should be carried out by skilled personnel with experience on the use of the PANSOPs. In those airports that have uh, many published procedures, this type of analysis can be quite extensive considering large airports and the number of uh, procedures that they have published in the publication of aeronautical information, I mean. And the analysis of this can be shown on a table like this one. As I was saying, the analysis is about validating whether the obstacle that is being analyzed affects or has an impact on one of the protection surfaces that has been defined for each of the procedures. Since this is a geometrical analysis and a numerical analysis, we can say that this type of analysis is a quantitative analysis if there's no penetration of the protection surfaces, so there's no impact on the procedure, and in that case, the obstacle would be authorized. As to the procedures carried out under visual flight rules, uh, the methodology to carry out this type of analysis in our case is the one that we carry out, and this one is different in that there is no protection surface associated to the procedures. Here, you can see an example of this type of visual procedures that are published in the visual approach chart of the airports. BAC, as I said, there are no obstacle clearance margins. What uh, we have published are some magnetic uh, markings that uh, the aircraft need to follow to get to the airport or to leave the airport. In this type of analysis, the principle of the flights to carry this type of procedures is to see and avoid obstacles. Pilots do not fly using as a reference the information from the instruments located in the flight deck, but they fly using, in the cockpit, sorry, but they fly using a visual reference. There is no obstacle clearance margins defined for these procedures, but there are a number of rules of a vertical and lateral separation or clearance with respect to the obstacles that are higher than uh, those uh, that the aircraft is overflying. So this type of analysis is a qualitative analysis. 
what we do is to consider the height of the obstacle, its location, its position with respect to uh, the visual point or reference point, and we need to conclude uh, if uh, the aircraft can avoid the obstacles and fly under safe conditions, since this is about a qualitative analysis. In this particular case, many times there is a need to have the opinion of the pilots. In most cases, for this type of analysis, while the obstacle is duly marked and illuminated, the risk is mitigated, but in many cases, we need to pay attention to those obstacles that are being requested, those obstacles that are already found in the environment, because in some occasions, barriers could be formed, barriers of obstacles could be formed, as you saw in the example of wind farms. Uh, in the end, they end up being developed in the middle of visual corridors or whenever there are limitations to the maximum altitude when uh, the uh, aircraft are over flying over those visual corridors, these obstacles could represent a risk in those cases. In the final phase of the study, we collect and gather the analysis that have been carried out for both instrument flights and visual flights and we consider the potential application of risk mitigation measures. The typical mitigation measures are marking of the obstacle, illumination or lightning, lighting, and its publication in the aeronautical charts. Uh, the result of the technical study many times does not lead directly to the approval or the rejection of the request because there are a number of factors that can influence on the final decision. For instance, in the case of works of general interest, uh, that the state is planning to undertake due to a specific general interest. In that particular case, we could justify a modification of the procedure that has been affected. But in any case, these are considerations that go beyond the technical reports. Finally, We need to underscore three aspects that, according to our experience, we consider relevant. The first one is the regulation, what I was uh, telling you at the beginning of my presentation, the need to dedicate time as a state to develop a regulation without any loopholes, without any gaps, that provides for any cases that could represent a problem to carry out an effective control of obstacles surrounding airports. The second key issue is that, especially in terms of the instruments, this is a part which is difficult to analyze in many cases. There is a need that the technical staff uh, carrying out this type of studies are specialized engineers with training on PANSOFT. Finally, the automation of processes, especially if the state is focused on managing a high number of requests for obstacles when uh, there's a point when they receive a specific number of uh, requests, if they do not have automated process, it is not possible to carry out this procedure. There is a need to invest time and money to develop this type of uh, applications, automa automated applications, so we can deal with a high number of requests. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Francisco, Thank you very much, Francisco, for your interesting presentation. In the question and answer box, are there are some questions uh, about your presentation. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, once again, thank you very much. And with this, we move on 
to the presentation by Rodrigo Ribeiro. Rodrigo, are you there? Sí, Fabio. Yes, Fabio. Just give me a second. Yes, good morning. I can share the presentation on my screen. I think that's better. Yes, sure. Well, you get ready. Let me talk about Rodrigo. Rodrigo is our expert in air drums and ground aids of the regional system. He's based here in the Lima office. He's an engineer in aeronautical infrastructure with nine years of experience as a uh, uh, officer at the Brazilian Air Force designing, planning, and building airdromes. He also worked for eight years in ANAC of Brazil, which is uh, the Civil Aviation Authority of Brazil, acting as AGA inspector and responsible for the airdrome oversight office since 2018. He's with us as an expert in airdromes and ground aids of the regional system, coordinating the review of the Latin American regulations and in the development of uh, training courses uh, for technical personnel and assistance to the states in the area of airdromes. He's also an AGA auditor of ICAO supporting the uh, Universal Safety Oversight Audit Program of ICAO and supports states in the preparation for these audits. So you have the presentation, Rodrigo. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Fabio. I'll try to share the presentation. Please confirm. Yes, we can see it. I'll put the right channel for the language, please. Uh, is that all right? Yes, we can hear you. Bien, buenos días. Ah, está bien, muchas gracias. Bien, Thank you. Días. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity of being in this webinar. I think it's a very important topic. It's a topic uh, in which uh, many states uh, face uh, difficulties uh, to address the issue of surfaces. And I hope that with the changes that are coming, it will become easier or at least more rational because we know of the challenges they represent the several airports that are operating without meeting the specifications for fully. So what I bring here today is an issue related to how the states or the role of the states to implement the SARPs of Annex 14 related to OLF, and also the support that the regional system provides the states, uh, provides to the member states, basically, the Spanish-speaking states and Brazil in South America in order to meet uh, that challenge and fulfill that role. So it's a quick presentation, Annex 14, as uh, we all know, presents a start related to OLS. And it's uh, clear and states must have a clear idea that the SARPs are contained in Annex 14 related to obstacle limitation services require the states to incorporate uh, two things. First, uh, parameters, obviously, to assess uh, the level of safety of uh, the operations. So you have an aerodrome that must have operations, a takeoff landing, uh, a holding pattern, and so on. And the aircraft must uh, have uh, the assurance that they will not uh, uh, crash against anything in the airspace. So the level of, age of safety is uh, uh, assessed based on the parameters of Annex 14. And on the other hand, these are also parameters uh, to protect the airspace in the sense of uh, preventing something 
uh, uh, being built or when something is built, it won't become an app, an obstacle that will affect uh, safety of operation. So these are two different roles that states play. Uh, I see it as two different roles. So the role related to the parameter is uh, to assess the safety of operations. That is assessed, for instance, in the certification processes and uh, um, subsequently in the oversight of aerodromes. That's a mandate of Annex 14. That certification must uh, consider the technical specifications of that same annex. And Panzer uh, Airdromes in Chapter 2 also defines uh, better what's uh, the scope of the certification process. And one of them is precisely obstacles. And on the other hand, uh, as specifications for the protection of the airspace, the state has to create mechanisms to restrict objects, uh, prevent them from penetrating the surfaces, uh, and also mechanisms to eliminate obstacles that have been built there. When we talk about assessing the safety of air operations or assessing the obstacles to see if they are a safety problem. Basically, we are assessing the present time because uh, if we are going to define uh, parameters, uh, they have to be based on what's happening right now. But when we talk about protection, we are also protecting the future. We want uh, the aerodrome or the airspace to be able to develop with new aircraft or bigger aircraft that have a more need for free space or not to restrict uh, the capacity in the future. In other words, to maintain the capacity of the airspace. And that is reflected uh, in the international community in terms of what is expected from the state in terms of safety oversight, which is assessed, for instance, uh, during the IKO audits. And there are many PQs that are related to obstacles, a restriction of obstacles, and signaling of obstacles, and so on. So the state, in order to fulfill this role, has its national regulations that reflect the SARPs of Annex 14. So regarding the evaluation of obstacles and the role of assessing uh, obstacles, we must define the limits of operation of the, air, of the aerodrome. We assess the context of the aerodrome and based on that, we can define the limits. For instance, it was the maximum aircraft, uh, max, the category of the aircraft, what type of operation, precision or non-precision, visual, and so forth. And in that role, the stays is imposing rules or restrictions uh, to the industry. In other words, it's imposing ro uh, rules uh, to the aerodrome operator, to the airlines, to uh, the air traffic service. and uh, to the procedure design uh, process. And when the state is creating mechanisms to restrict the objects in uh, the surrounding or uh, even outside of uh, the surfaces, uh, there is uh, limits of uh, heights above uh, the surfaces, the state is restricting the use of the ground. It's imposing a restriction to the building or construction of something so that it won't affect the aerodrome, the operator, or the air operators. It's really to protect uh, civil aviation. So it affects uh, third parties, as uh, Tiago mentioned in his presentation, it affects uh, third parties that have nothing to do with the uh, civil aviation industry. Uh, somebody who wants to build a, a building or to put a uh, mobile telephony tower or some other thing. So basically, the states, 
when acting in the civil aviation industry, for instance, it has to make sure that an aerodrome is uh, safe, what type of operations can be carried out, what type of aircraft can be used at the airport, what are the minima of uh, the operations to use the aerodrome uh, due to the existence of obstacles. It basically, it's uh, the Civil Aviation Authority that can impose uh, those rules uh, to the industry. Now, when you're going to restrict the use of the ground and say you can build there up to a given height because beyond that it will affect air navigation it doesn't involve only the civil aviation authority but also other authorities of the state for instance the local authorities that authorize those implementations so in the role of the mechanism for restricting the objects that affect a third parties the states when we only think of the Civil Aviation Authority as a big difficulty because it's not uh, the authority itself on its own uh, that can do it on its own. Uh, the authority cannot do it on its own. It involves other authorities of the, the same states and interaction with those other authorities. And that's the case in most of our countries. So somehow, in the regional system, which is an agreement among states here in the SAM region, uh, uh, to which uh, Cuba uh, was added, so uh, basically, uh, the Latin speaking and Spanish speaking countries in Brazil and Cuba, the system is aimed at uh, cooperating to improve the level of safety in civil aviation of member states. And uh, there is a, a website of SRVSOP of Aero, dot Aero for if you want more information. But that regional system tries to support uh, states in terms of uh, safety and obviously on issues related to uh, obstacle control in the aerodrome. So I'm an expert in the technical committee of the system. What does the system do? Well, one thing is it takes uh, the types of Annex 14 in the area of aerodromes and creates or develops what we call the Latin American Aeronautical Regulations, the LARS, L-A-R-S. In that case, in the case of AGA, airdromes and ground days, the LARS reflect those SARPs. And the member states, when they got together under the system, they committed to adopt or harmonize their national regulations with those Latin American aeronautical regulations. The regulations uh, were not uh, mandatory on the states, but uh, the states uh, signed the commitment uh, to uh, reflect them into their national regulations. So with that, we support the states in improving their safety oversight systems at the aerodromes, and as a result of that, improve their effective implementation levels during the uh, uh, USOAP uh, audits. And there's an issue there. We used uh, to work in the LAGA, uh, AGA law says in the Latin American regulations incorporating the SARPs of Annex 14 in into two Latin American regulations, uh, 154 and 153. 154 includes uh, OLS parameters, basically Chapter 4 of Annex 14, objects outside of the OLS, and um, signaling of obstacles. And on the other hand, uh, uh, 153 related to the operation of air drums and the obligation of operation operators to uh, uh, monitor obstacles to conduct aeronautical studies uh, request uh, for new objects and obviously we expect uh, the states uh, to harmonize or adopt uh, 
of these uh, parameters. Only that there is an issue there with those uh, regulations, with those uh, Latin American regulations that are reflected in the national regulations. Even with the national regulations, so they are not directly uh, harmonized with the LARS, but they come directly from NS14, and that happens in most of the states. Those uh, regulations are developed and are applicable to airdrome operators. Those are regulations that are used when you go and do the certification of airdromes or to give a license to an airdrome. So it applies to airdrome operators. But as we saw, the role of the state is also to assess the airdrome and decide what can operate there, what do we need to do in order to make those operations safe. But uh, another part that another part that ha doesn't have to do with the airdrome operator or with, with the airlines is that I'm going to prevent a third party outside of the airdrome to build something that will constitute an obstacle, a tower or, I don't know, some other implementation that will represent an obstacle, but that person is not an airdrome operator. Or it's a third party outside of the civil aviation industry. So uh, that usually happens. Uh, it's not applicable to that person. So what we did recently was created within the AGA law says the law 77 and number 77 comes from a far 77 from the United States FAR, which is a regulation that deals with objects implementations and activities that may have a negative impact on safety or regularity of air operations this is a long name but basically it's a regulation that uh, uh, reflects in a specific regulation what we are trying to restrict within the airdrome and even outside of the OLS uh, for the airdrome, and which affect the third parties that are, are not the, the air, airdrome operator. So that regulation uh, includes a restriction of objects uh, inside and outside of the OLS. Uh, for instance, requests or re requirements or criteria for requesting the construction of an object that's part of the mechanism of the state to prevent uh, the construction of obstacles, a part of aeronautical studies and the part of uh, signaling parameters that we are just uh, developing. In addition, that regulation brings about other requirements regarding other implementations or restrictions uh, for implementations in the surrounding, for instance, uh, things that, that might attract uh, wildlife or lights that might uh, uh, create confusion amongst the pilots, but that's not part of the situation. And the large 153 and 154 continue to be parameters regarding obligations of the airdrome operators. For instance, the obligation of the airdrome operator to prepare a surface plan, um, an airdrome protection plan to make a survey of uh, the object so that that can be promulgated by the state or for the uh, operator to do surveillance or monitoring of uh, the obstacles. If uh, the operator identifies a construction, they uh, notify the state so that the state will use its mechanisms and prevent uh, the construction of that obstacle. Or if it's uh, an obstacle already in place, it may be uh, eliminated. So this is something that we did in the system and was approved in March of this year, and it applies to all, in quotes, all those who want to build something. And it also applies, obviously, to the airdrome operator. If within the airdrome, they want to uh, do some type of construction. And the LARS 153, 144 apply only to airdrome operators. And the system 
in order to support the stage, we try to have a complete cycle, so to speak, which uh, which includes uh, model regulations because the states have to harmonize or they can adopt uh, uh, the regulations based on the SARPs of NS14, based on the procedures of PANS airdromes that uh, sometimes uh, becomes uh, requirements uh, for regulations. We also develop, obviously, with uh, the support of the AGA experts of the states, guidance material for the implementation of uh, uh, those uh, specification it comes from the PANS airdromes and from documents, for instance, document 9137, part six, that talks about obstacle limitation. And that is reflected in the airdrome inspector manual that the states can use as a model for preparing their own manuals for the inspectors. And advisory circulars that are guidance material. We have a circular on obstacle control that is uh, uh, being reviewed for publication. And we try to provide training in order to uh, uh, discuss with the experts of the states uh, the requirements and the guidance material, the guidelines uh, for the industry and for the inspectors, and to close the cycle, because obviously um, there is a training and we discuss the experience of the experts that gives us a feedback in order to improve the regulations and to improve the guidance material. So basically that's it, and uh, that's uh, the role of the state, and uh, how we try to support uh, the states. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, for your presentation. The work of the regional system is uh, very important for the states. And a couple of panels back, experts presented this needs for the actors within the airport, but also uh, outside of the airport. Uh, the LARS uh, will continue progressing as experts. Uh, give their feedback. Thank you, Rodrigo, for your presentation. Now we have our colleague, uh, Fernando Elian. I would like to tell you information about Fernando. He comes from Uruguay. He works for Dinasia of Uruguay, which fulfills the roles of air navigation service provider, but also civil aviation regulator. And Fernando, has over 35 years of experience at Dinasia. He's, uh, he has, he's a mapper, but he's also specialized on the issue of obstacles from the beginning of his career. He is currently an AGA inspector certified by the regional system with a GCI AGA, which is the Governmental Inspector course, and Fernando has collaborated with us in the drafting of the chapters related to obstacles of the Laga Art sect. And he's also an expert on this uh, topic, as in the case of Tiago. So thank you very much, Fernando. Fernando, are you there? Yes, sorry, I am here. Do you want me to share your slides or do you wish to do it directly? Let's see if I can do it. Yes, I would also like to tell you something else about Fernando. Fernando also participated with us in the airport certification exercise in Montevideo. This is an exercise that DINASA did along with the regional office and also the certification of Laguna de Sauce, close to the capital city of Uruguay. So this is part of the experience that he will share with us now. 
I don't know if you can see my screen now. No, not yet. Ahora. Can you see my screen now? Yes, now it is ready. We can see it. Well, first of all, let me clarify, Flavio, that I have been in aviation for the last 35 years, but this is because I started very young. It doesn't represent my age at all. As a way of a caveat, well, thank you very much to you, to Rodrigo, the system for inviting me today. And as you can see on this first slide, our objective is to present the experience that Uruguay had with respect to certification of airports, which in my opinion, it is, well, my opinion is subjective. It was a good experience and it, not, it was not traumatizing at all. Evidently, this has to do with my own personal opinion, but I believe that this can extend to the certification process of what we have done here in Uruguay, because I believe that we have had a good relationship with the operator. We will see this later on. As I was saying, this is the experience of Uruguay in that regard. I didn't mention this at the beginning, but we are going to go through this quickly. We all know about the surfaces. We have already talked about the different surfaces and my predecessors have already explained and clarified the current surfaces and the new processes that will be undertaken. So I think I will skip through this part because I believe that most of you are already aware of this. And this dates from the times in which uh, the obstacle limitation surfaces were designed. In this regard, at the onset, we applied Annex 14 based on Chapter 4, which is where all these surfaces are contained. And as I will present to you, we moved on to adopting L LARs in our country, and we were able to do the certification of airports. As I was saying, Uruguay, I believe this was back in 2015, in my case, I was not yet part of the certification team, but I joined the team afterwards. Our country adopted the LAR AGA set, as explained by Rodrigo before. This, uh, this is a set of uh, regulations that were processed and developed by the regional system. Here you have them listed. The set is made up by LAR 139, 154, 155, 139, which is on certification. And <clears throat> lastly, uh, LAR 77. As I said, we adopted as a country the LAR AGA set for which, and, and these were approved at the level of the regional system. The LAR 139, which is uh, related to certification, is the one this is where we ask the operator that he should abide by it. And in the case of the OLS, they should apply the corresponding chapter in LAR 154, Appendix 4. 
based on this, Uruguay, well, the concessioner rather, began the process of certification. And based on that, we conducted the evaluation of such a process. As you can see, certification in Uruguay reached 100% of the airport, but do not get too excited. As you know, Uruguay is a small country in terms of commercial airport with aviation carrying several pas passengers. We only have two of those, but still, it's good to know that we have been able to reach 100% of airports certified. This happened just recently. The second airport that was certified is the one from Laguna del Sauce. And with that, we have been able to complete the first stage of what was anticipated in the air navigation plan. Now, other airports have been given in concession. I am getting a little bit ahead of myself. But I assume that these new airports would become will become part of this process. We are talking about five or six additional airports in our country. This is just a snapshot of some images. This is the main airport in our country. As I said, we did an exercise here and we received the first certification. This is the airport of Carrasco. This is the terminal. This is the Laguna del Sauce airport, which was recently certified. This is an airport located in the eastern part, close to the Punta del Este city, which is well known in our country. This is like our main resort in the country, Punta del Este. Well, this is the airport of Carrasco. We have two runways. The main runway is the 0725. It recently changed. It has 3,200 meters by 45 of width and the north-south runway. 019, it has 2,250 per 45. The Laguna del Sauce airport, as I said, is the one located in the eastern part, close to Punta del Este, and it receives a lot of passengers during tourism times. We have the main runway, the OA26, and the north-south runway as well. The main one has 2,130 meters, and the north-south, 2,600 meters. Those are the two airports that, as I said, have been certified and the operator had to work hard to achieve that objective. In this case, I am distinguishing the regulation from the process of the certification as such, because the theoretical part the regulatory part has already been defined. It has been put in writing and we need to abide by it. And the challenging part is to comply with it and carry out this process. Fortunately, we have been successful and the concessionaire, the operator has been able to comply with it. And they have worked together to achieve this goal. And I will give you my own opinion about this uh, later on. In terms of the requirements that we considered when initiating the certification processes of the two airdromes, these are the ones established under LAR 154, Appendix 4 or Annex 4. And they are very clear. We followed those procedures or requirements to request for the documents to the concessioner. As I was saying, uh, under airdromes, as it has been established in this annex, we request 
the air drone protection zone plans or blueprints with the obstacle limitation surfaces that have already been discussed the approach transitional surface the inner horizontal vertical surfaces in the case of the airport of carrasco we have a precision runway category one ils so in that case we requested the remaining surfaces for a runway of those characteristics. On the other hand, we also requested topographic information. It is worth mentioning here. And I think that this is part of what I was telling you about. This is my own personal opinion, perhaps. We exchanged information in terms of topographic information and obstacle information with the concessioner, considering that this was a new process, especially with the first airport, uh, the airport of Carrasco. So what we did was to provide the information that we had available, in addition to the information obtained by the concessioner to achieve this goal in order to maintain safety. We also requested the information forms or cards that are considered in Annex 4 and the longitudinal dimensioning profile blueprint or plan of the runway. Also, in accordance with Annex 4, the navigation aid protection zone plans and also topographic information. This is just a view of the effects of what was delivered as an end product by the operator. These are all the areas for which regulation is requested. And this was analyzed by the certification team. In this case, we have the Carrasco Airport. This is the part that would represent the protection areas that are established under the LAR, L -A -R, and this other part would be the protection zones or areas and the obstacle area that we have in the main airport of our country, Carrasco Airport. The same happened with the Laguna del Sauce Airport, which was recently certified we presented the areas as indicated in the LAR and also with the additional information on obstacles. So, both airports required an exchange between the operator and the authority. And based on that, we were able to complete this final product. I would like to focus on this particular aspect because, personally speaking, I think that this is one of the most important parts of this presentation based on the certification experience. Later on, you might see a slide which talks more specifically about this. The collaboration and exchange that we had between the concessioner and the certification team allowed us to achieve the results that we have had. As I said, this is uh, the information card, the information sheet. This is the form that includes data on the airdrome. And this is information or the card for navigation aids. And this is what the operator presented based on these forms. As I said, this is just my own personal opinion, but I believe that it is applicable and can be 
taken into account in the certification processes. We have had a very good relationship with the operator. We always tried to establish a continuous and ongoing dialogue with the operator. And in terms of my area uh, under my responsibility and my specialty, we had a good exchange with the operator to achieve our goal. I believe that in this case, an airport certification is not just a goal or an objective of the concessioner or the operator in order to have an airport with the necessary safety and security measures, but it is also of interest to the aviation authority because this allows them to have airports under safe conditions in accordance with the necessary regulations. I am saying here, I'm listing here, one of the bullet points is no imponer, do not impose. I think it's more interesting to convince rather than impose on. I do not believe that the authority should exercise authority except when there is a need to do so. So I believe that in these processes, we should try to convince, raise awareness. Evidently, as I have listed there, we need to have a participatory spirit and to open to any proposals or alternatives, provided they do not infringe safety. In our case, we always maintained we always maintained this contact with them. So if something could not be understood or interpreted correctly, then we could contact them and we could raise our opinion or share the experience that we could have in that regard so we can achieve our goal. Therefore, in the case of Uruguay, as I pointed out, I don't think this was a traumatizing experience. Uh, on the contrary, I believe this was a good experience for both the concessionaire and the certification team. And in personally, I think it was a very good experience as an expert. I do understand that this is everybody's task. And I believe that somebody has already mentioned this and I, will, I, and I would like to underscore it. The OLS, both chapter four of Annex 14, the PANSOFT itself, appendix or Annex four of LAR 154, LAR 154, they are not sufficiently disseminated. So in the case of a concession, they can be easily interpreted. Sometimes for us, even though we have been working on this for a long time, sometimes for us, it is difficult to understand or interpret some regulations. I do believe that this is even more difficult for an operator that even though the operator needs to have the right capacity and people, personnel, he needs to have a more in-depth knowledge of these regulations when they are going through the certification process. That is why I insist on having this participation or participatory spirit, collaboration spirit. And I also believe that these technical aspects should be, these technical and specific aspects should be more widely disseminated so we can achieve the objectives in terms of the outcomes so we can maintain safety across our region. As you can read on this slide, in case of non-compliance, 
This has already been specified. We have to identify the risks for safety. We have evaluated the safety risks. We looked for potential alternatives to this adverse effect on any of the evaluations or assessments of the problems identified. And based on that, if there was no immediate solution that in my own, in the specific case of obstacles, it is the removal of the obstacles, the necessary safety studies were conducted. And based on that, they proposed an alternative safety studies or nautical studies. As listed there, the necessary studies were submitted and based on that, they were analyzed and they were accepted as such. As a way of an additional illustration, I just wanted to talk about one of these airports that was not part of the certification of the two other airports I already mentioned. One of the new airports under concession is the Rivera Airport. Just to give you, so, as, so I can give you an example of an adverse effect in this case. The operator and the certification team have uh, held a number of meetings and a problem that we have with respect to and impact on the approach surface of one of the runways. In this case, this is just to illustrate my comment. As you can see, there's a small hill that affects the approach surface or the takeoff climb. This is being evaluated. I am just sharing this with you as a way of an example. In this case, the concessionaire is conducted its own studies, analysis, and measurements. We will hold additional meetings. And based on that, I am sure we'll be able to find the best solution. So this airport can have the necessary and safe conditions to operate. So he can be duly certified. Uh, before I finish, I would like to add, and I think I have already mentioned this, LAR7, in my humble opinion, is going to be an instrument. I know that it is a regulation, but it would be a good instrument to disseminate obstacle limitations served outside the aeronautical field, the lay users, at, is, as it has been targeted, the government agencies, which are not directly involved in aeronautical matters, and it will help them to better interpret, even though LAR 77 has been recently approved. In our case, the process of exchange with the users over the last few years has made it possible for the municipalities, the city councils to understand that the areas surrounding the airports are not free areas to build other structures. And any permits issued by those municipalities or city councils might be affecting airports, including important airports, which provide tourism flow to those areas. So I believe that LAR 77 is of great support to the dissemination of the limitations around the airports. And I believe that we have one additional tool that will help us disseminate a race awareness among the lay users and the companies 
the businesses or whoever wishes to build in the area surrounding the airport, that it is not just a matter of receiving a municipal authorization, but it requires an aeronautical analysis so we can achieve the goal of maintaining and having safe airports so the community can continue growing. So I am going to stop there and I am open to take Thank you, Fernando, for sharing your experience. Very interesting how Uruguay trusted the system and adopted the regional regulations as its own. And here we are seeing uh, what you showed with your experience. So we thank you very much for your participation in this uh, webinar. And to close, we have one last presentation. Just give me a second. We have a one last presentation on the next steps. Remembering the dates shown by RC at the beginning of this webinar, currently the task force on obstacles is presenting to the Air Navigation Commission for a preliminary revision the proposed uh, amendments. ICAO, unlike other years, is uh, working on these uh, packages of amendments as one package. What happened before was uh, that the provisions of the annex were published uh, that, that had to be fulfilled by the states, but uh, not together with uh, the guidance material and that it made it very difficult for the states uh, to do the implementation. Many states uh, had to wait uh, for the guidance material of ICAO uh, before doing the implementation of these requirements. However, ICAO is now working in a different way. With the resources available, in order to promulgate uh, these standards and recommended practices, but at the same time publish uh, the guidance material. And I say this because uh, there are some questions in the, the webinar regarding guidance material. And just to let you know that as recently happened with uh, the implementation of the GRF, where ICAO, in addition to publishing the requirements in the annex, it also published an updated circular on this issue and uh, procedures in the PANS airdromes. And all, we also expect that in this new uh, implementation, the whole package will be pub published, the updated uh, SARPs, as well as uh, the procedures under the PANS and uh, the guidance material in the, the document on airport services. So we will have a complete uh, package that will be supplemented by training that both ICAO headquarters as well as the regional offices and of course uh, the regional system in the case of our region will provide. So we expect uh, that in the state letter it will be circulated next year. It will take some time for the states to review the letter. And we expect that the adoption by the council, according to RC, will be in early 2025. That might change. The dates are changing for different reasons. But with all this, we expect that if the effective days, in other words, when all the provisions are published is July 2025. We're thinking that the applicable date will be in six years, in November 2032. It seems a lot of time, but these are major changes, major changes that, that will have an impact 
on the uh, surroundings of the airports and the states. These changes seek to bring closer the uh, protection services that uh, flight procedure designers use with the Annex 14 It's a separation. There was a gap there where the provisions of Annex 14 uh, were lagging behind with respect to the development of the new types of aircraft or the development of a new uh, procedures and the new technologies. And that's why this change is so important. Uh, it's a uh, it's kind of a, a revolution in chapter four. So although it seems a lot of time, we think that both the states as well as the airports can start working in the local environment and get prepared for these changes. One of the things that we can start doing is assess the impact of these new provisions. Of course, the provisions have not been published yet, but we also have an idea of uh, what the new, uh, oh, it, the new surfaces will be like to uh, facilitate the urban development around the airports in some sectors where these developments will not affect safety. So within that context, the airports can start assessing their vicinity. It's also interesting, something that all the colleagues uh, mentioned based on their experience regarding the need to identify the stakeholders. Many times they are external to the airport, even the aeronautical context, because of the urban developers that want to build high buildings do not necessarily know about these matters, but the local authorities, they have urban planning sections that should have a contact with our civil aviation authorities with our airports. So maybe it's a good moment to start reviewing what are these best practices of uh, communication also to identify these stakeholders. In addition to that, many of the colleagues uh, talked about the automation of processes, how these uh, revision processes are being carried out in the states. It's something that uh, the states can start doing. Obviously, what we are doing here and we also urge the uh, uh, regulators of the states and the airports to share these experiences regarding current issues related to obstacles. And for that, we open the doors of the regional offices of the organization, also of uh, the regional system in the case of uh, uh, the SAM region. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, ICAO, is not going to release these new requirements without uh, providing sufficient guidance material that will allow the states and the airports to get ready for this new change. So with this uh, presentation that we're going to post on the website, we give you some resources. I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning that the initiative of uh, carrying out this activity came from a global symposium organized by ICAO headquarters in 2021, last year. So here I give you the link uh, of the presentations of that global OLS symposium, which is very interesting. And you can see together with other members of uh, the obstacle task force presentations about these new requirements these new proposals, let's say. Also here, there are portals like the first one where ICAO already has a portal where it publishes a free of charge of the latest uh, version of all the annexes to the convention. You can register there and uh, have access I think some documents will also be posted soon, so uh, you can register. And this last uh, link, uh, Uniting Aviation, Uniting Aviation, could be of interest. And uh, finally, some of the participants already shared uh, some questions. 
in the question and answer box, but in this uh, mail, you can also send your uh, queries. So with this, uh, we end our webinar today. Uh, I want to thank again all the colleagues uh, who prepared their presentations and participated in this activity also to the uh, administrative uh, support team, the interpreters and uh, the uh, personnel of the local office uh, that contributed to this event. With this, we say goodbye, wishing you the best. And of course, remember, at the end of this session, you will receive a survey, a short survey to give your feedback. I wanted to ask the colleagues uh, to turn on your cameras to thank you all for your participation. Have an excellent day. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.